read the prophets in the Old Testament. I trust that when you read the prophets in the Old Testament, that having gone through Zechariah, you'll be better readers, and I will too be better readers of the Old Testament, especially the prophets. Being able to figure out visions, there aren't a lot, but they come in uh, groups in the Old Testament. And you see it in the whole frame of Scripture. That's very, very important. So I was meeting with somebody this week. You know, they're trying to grapple with uh, some issues, theology. And I said, well, you know, it takes like 30 years and an hour to get it. <laughs> because the more of the Bible you have in you, the more it connects. It's just, there's a lot we can say here, but when, the more you read the prophets, the more you're going to see for yourself. Wow, Joel said the same thing, just a different way. Amos said the same thing, he just said it a different way, in a different time. So, thank you for braving Zechariah. <laughs> Tomatoes to throw are free at the back door. <laughs> All right. So, always a little bit of review, and I'm not going to have as much review tonight. I'll try not to, but you remember the king is coming. He did. The king is coming. He will. The whole deal in the Old Testament was centered around 586 B.C. Is Israel going to obey or not? No, they didn't. So, therefore, the uh, Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem after the Assyrians had destroyed the kingdom, the ten tribes in the north. So, like brother, like brother. <laughs> they just don't listen. All right? So, 70 years later, according to all these prophecies, I'm going to spank you, but then I'm going to love you. Because God has a covenant with his people. That's the main thing. So these prophets, Zechariah, Haggai, and under the leadership of Joshua and Zerubbabel, they begin the rebuilding of, of the temple, which ends up in Nehemiah and Ezra, the building of the city itself. So they were supposed to return to the Lord through the prophets, and they did in so much as they began to build the building again. But as we learn, even in later in Haggai, they really weren't fully devoted to the Lord. So then after this opening sermon in the first six verses, Joshua is giving, given in one night eight visions. Now we've been going through these visions. Tonight is the last of the eight visions. And they're meant to encourage the people who have come back to Jerusalem and are beginning to work on the temple. Does everybody have notes? If you don't, raise your hand, they'll get them to you. Okay. So the first vision was the man among the myrtle trees, and we found out that was none other than the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, who is, has his angels on horses patrolling the earth. And Jerusalem is in trouble while the nations are at ease. That was the point that should not be. Okay. Then we have another vision, the four horns. It comes in two parts. First, the world empires that are going to come about during the time of the Gentiles. They match up with Daniel's vision of the world kingdoms. You can go back as far as Assyria and then Egypt. And then you pick it up here with Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. Okay? But each of those empires comes and go. One comes up, cuts the other one down. That was the second part of the second vision. The third, third vision, the man with the measuring line. Again, this is the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord, who says, I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. So always keep the context. They're building the house. They're crying because it doesn't look like Solomon's. Oh, it doesn't look like Daddy's. Oh. Just work on it because God's going to come to that temple and he will dwell in the midst and he's going to make Jerusalem much, much bigger. And he will even be a fire of protection around Jerusalem. That hasn't happened yet, 
but it will. Another thing, the priesthood is restored. The nation is restored. And this comes in the form of Joshua, the high priest vision. You remember, he was standing before the angel of the Lord. Again, this is the, the Lord in heaven, the Messiah. And Satan is there accusing him. And who does the high priest represent? The people. And Satan's going, look, God, you got a covenant with these people, but look how bad they are. Because he's the accuser. All right? I wonder how much he was before the throne this week in my life, you know? <laughs> look again. <laughs> but what does God do? He says, your sins are forgiven. Boom. Just that fast. It's all grace, and it's demonstrated in new clothes. Remember, he had filthy garments. Now he has new, clean, priestly garments. That's also a picture of salvation, no doubt about that. Paul brings it up, the writer of Hebrews does. It's what happens to us. We get clothed in Christ's righteousness. But in this case, the priesthood representing the people is cleansed. All right? Now listen, you guys were a symbol. You're a symbol of cleansing of the nation because I'm going to bring my branch. Bing. Remember that? My servant and the branch. Messianic title. No doubt about it. This is talking about Jesus. He is the stone. He has seven eyes. And uh, he, God, I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. Hip, hip, hooray. When's that going to happen? The kingdom. When they, when they accept the Messiah. So far they haven't. They rejected him when he first came. But that's not the end of the story. He's coming back. They will accept him as the stone. Remember the stone? Certainly another messianic metaphor. You've got a lot of messianic titles and messianic metaphors. He has seven eyes, which matches the description of Jesus as the foundation stone with seven eyes in the book of Revelation. We see in Revelation 4 and 5, the Messiah is a lion and a lamb, and the lion had seven horns, strength, seven eyes, omniscient, and seven flames of fire before the throne. Those all represented the Holy Spirit. You can't take a selfie of the Holy Spirit, right? He doesn't. But he's described in sevens, eyes, horns, flames. And what, did, what happened when Jesus came the first time? Behold, <laughs> the Spirit came. This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit, like a dove, not a dove, but like a dove, something ascended on Jesus. So he has the Holy Spirit. Then we came to the next vision, which was the olive tree and the lampstand. So the olive trees in our discussion and exposition, we figured out that this is the supply of the Spirit coming through the olive trees to the lampstand, which is the work in the temple, on the temple. Remember, the seven eyes will be glad when they see Zerubbabel measuring and beginning to work on the temple. The seven eyes, of course, are the spirits, the spirit of the Lord. Okay? And so they're going to be glad when they see this work begin on the temple. And it's all going to be through the power of the spirit flowing through Zerubbabel, the governor, king, and Joshua, the high priest. One from David, one from Aaron. Guess what? You got the Messiah right there. All right? So, when the temple's done, which it was four years later, there were shouts, grace to it. All right? There's a song, grace, grace, grace to it. <laughs> All right? So, it was finished in 516 B.C. All right. Now, remember, we jump forward, which is not unusual. This is very characteristic. When you go to the book of Revelation, what is Revelation drawing off of? The Old Testament. So you had two guys in the Old Testament that God used through his spirit to do a building project. In the future, guess what? God's going to take two other guys, same description, same words. Olive trees, lampstands who stand before the Lord. He's going to use them in the future in a big project concerning Jerusalem. 
which is they're the two witnesses. And remember, I told you who they were, right? Remember that? Did you write it down? The two witnesses are, we have no clue. Okay. So don't worry about it. There are two guys God will choose in the future. That's all you need to know. <laughs> all right. Then we came to the next um, vision, which was the flying scroll. So this is about cleansing the land. Remember, the scroll had uh, information about those who steal, which is on one side of the tablet, and those who bear false witness on another side of the tablet. So the law is going through the land, and it also said the banner, the scroll, flying through the air was a what? Do you remember? Starts with C. Curse. And remember, it was going to go into the house of those sinners. And how long was it going to stay there? All night. Spend the night in the house and consume the house of the wicked. Remember, I'm just, this is bang, bang, machine gun. These are these visions. So God, not only is he going to deal with the nations, he's going to deal with his people. He's going to cleanse the land. And that's not a new item, and not a new issue, not a new concept at all in the Old Testament. I'm going to purge you. Remember, it even says in the last days, two-thirds of the nation will die. So no shock, God is going to go through the land. It's a picture of his law going through the land, and the wicked are consumed. That's some terrible thing to even contemplate for a little bit. God spending the night in your house condemning you, and you wake up in the morning and your house is consumed. Yikes. Okay? So, then we come to the seventh vision, which was the woman in the basket. All right? And who do we call her? Do you remember her name? Huh? Mrs. Wicked. Yeah. <laughs> and so, she is the embodiment of wickedness. All right? And God said, this is what you look like. This is your appearance throughout the whole land. So God is going to take Mrs. Wicked or the whole concept of wickedness before it was individual, right? I'm going to go into the very house of the wicked and consume them. Now it's corporate. I'm going to take the whole evil system and put it in a basket and haul it off. Where is he going to haul it? To Shinar, which is another word for Babylon. Everybody knows that going way back. We looked at those texts last week. To Babylon, okay? So, and there, God's going to build a pedestal for her, put her there, and then destroy her. So, remember, why these visions? Why these visions? To confuse us? No. To encourage those working on the temple. You're going to be sanctified in a major way. You're going to be made God's people. And God's going to deal with the nations who have always dealt harsh with you. That's what's been going on so far. All right? So modern day Iraq, Iran. And I think what a perfect time to finish Zechariah in the next few weeks <laughs> with what's going on in the world. You'll be shocked. So... You go to the New, New Testament again, leaving the Old Testament. You go to the book of Revelation. We see Mrs. Wicked again, but she has a different name. Her name is Mystery Babylon, the mother of all harlots. If you're familiar with Revelation, that would come to mind. All right? So John is seeing the destruction of Babylon the same as Zechariah. He's just seeing it in different visions. Okay, and here's Mrs. Wicked. She says in the last days, this world empire, this global Babylon, I'm a queen. I'm not a widow. No one's going to harm me. I'll never see mourning. <laughs> yes, you will. All right. So again, so many times in Revelation, all that's happening is John 
through the spirit of Jesus, is going back to the Old Testament, saying the same thing, but just in a different way with a different metaphor or image. Okay? And even in Revelation, it says, not only is it a global world system, but it's a capital city. It actually says Babylon will be destroyed with fire in one day. So evidently, when Jesus returns, there's the economic capital of the Antichrist that's going to go up in smoke. All right? So here's last day stuff because it's in that day. Remember, the prophets throw it out into the future. Mrs. Wicked, wickedness is taken out of Israel, taken back to where she started in the first place, the Tower of Babel, Babylon, and there she will be consumed by the presence of Christ coming. Okay? Now we come to the eighth vision tonight. That wasn't too bad for the review, was it? <laughs> All right. Four chariots. All right. Now, I'm using a lot of PowerPoint because visions are visual. <laughs> you know, if you don't like these pictures, draw your own. Right? <laughs> There's lots of them out there, and I pick what I think are the favorites, you know, capturing the idea. But you can use your own sanctified imagination in these things as well. I mean, remember, God is painting a picture. That's what the vision is. All right. So now I lifted my eyes. That's a tip. We're in the eighth vision. And again, I look and behold, four chariots were coming forth from between two mountains. Okay. Four chariots, two mountains, and the mountains were strong. That's bronze mountains. It means strong. Okay? So, the two mountains are prominent in the vision. So are the horses. Now, let's think about this. Chariots. Did we just sing about that? Look, what song did we just sing? O oh, worship the king, right? O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his praise. We just sang this. Whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form. Chariots of wrath. All right? Now think about this. You remember way back in the Old Testament in 2 Kings? What happened when there was this lad, young man, with Elisha? And the armies were surrounding the city of Dothan, which was in the northern part of Israel. Do you remember that story? Way back in the Old Testament. And the lad was afraid, right? Oh, look at the big armies coming against us. And for a split second, remember, God opened his eyes. And what did he see? Chariots. There are more of them fighting for us than there are fighting for them. So every once in a while, very, very, very rare. You didn't get a vision, I'm, I'm telling you. It's extremely rare in the Old Testament. Somebody gets a glimpse of what is going on, just a handful, maybe less than a handful, of what's going on around us. So these chariots are fighting on behalf of God's people. Listen to Psalm 68. The chariots of God are myriads. Thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as he was at Mount Sinai. So here we have four chariots of God. Just four. He's got myriads. All right. Now we don't know where the two mountains are. Some people say it represented two mountains in the north, Hermon and Teman, you know, north and south. In other words, coming out from the land of Israel. That's one option. Or, you know, when Jesus comes again, the Mount of Olives is going to split. So you got one mountain on one side and one on the other. That's another option, but they're kind of, you know, uh, not many people hold those views, but they're out there. Or there are mountains in heaven, you know, these mystical mountains in heaven. But I don't think either of those is the right interpretation. I think it's the Mount of Olives and Mount Zion with the valley in between. This is where God is going to fight. This is where his war machines are going to go out from. If you don't listen to this verse, Amos 1, 2. 
the, and speaking of the same time period in the last days, the Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice. So really, it, wherever the two mountains are or whatever they are, God is going forth, and you can see it because of these war chariots. Got it? No, yes? All right, any questions? <laughs> All right. So, with the first chariot were red horses. So we got colors now. And with the second, black horses pulling these chariots. I mean, think of the Elisha story. Remember when the Elijah, when the chariots came down and picked them up and took them off to heaven? So they're doing God's work. Here it's going to be war and wrath. All right? Then you had white horses, and the fourth chariot was pulled by strong dappled or, you know, uh, kind of grayish spotted horses. All right? So you got all these different colors, red, black, white, and this dappled or spotted horses. All right? Now, some people say, oh, these are the horses of Revelation. Not so fast. Remember the four horses in Revelation 6? Well, they do different things at a different time. At the beginning of the tribulation, these do something at the very end, right before Christ comes. So probably not the same horses, and the colors are a little bit different. In Revelation, you had this uh, fake peace and war and famine and plagues and death. God uses this kind of imagery to convey his wrath on occasion, all right? here these four chariots are doing something that we're going to read about. Verse 4, back in Zechariah, I spoke and said to the angel who was speaking with me, remember that guy? His buddy angel that's always there to help him interpret. All right? Sometimes he's talking to the angel of the Lord. Sometimes there's other angels doing things, like on these chariots, or in chapter 1 on the horses, but he's always got his interpreting angel with him throughout the book. He can talk to him. What's that mean? And the interpreting angel gives him answers, all right? So he said, what are these, my Lord, talking to the angel? And the angel replied to Zechariah, these are the four, what? Spirits. Anybody know if there's another Hebrew word for spirit? Or it's the same word? Wind, ruach, depending on the context to me wind or spirit so these four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the lord of all the earth aha so they've been they've been in heaven they're standing before the lord of all the earth and they're being sent out okay being sent out for a purpose and you got this there's, there's so many of these, but time constraints. You know, you, we could almost spend one night on each verse. <laughs> these are just a couple cross-references. Psalm 104, he makes the winds his messengers. See that? Angels, messengers, winds. So you don't put one against the other. They, you know, the reality is the messengers, the angels are like the wind. Okay? Flaming fire, his ministers. Oh, man. Think about the Lord's army. Remember we used to sing when I was a kid, we're in the Lord's army. Not a chant, man. Look at this army. <laughs> now we will be in the future when we return with him. We'll rule and reign and fight with him. But for now, his army is the host of heaven. Not the hostess, but the hosts, which means these battle army guys. Okay? Warriors. Because... The Messiah himself in the Psalms is the divine warrior. So he sends out his chariots to fight. Okay? Listen to this passage. I don't know. This is, uh, you know, kind of buried back there in 1 Kings. Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right and left. The Lord said, now here's the Lord talking to his Angels, uh, who will entice Ahab to go 
and fall at Ramoth Gilead. And one said to this, while another said to that, and they were like, will you do it? No, will you do it? <laughs> okay. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will go. I will entice them. So you have angels doing the Lord's work in all kind of ways. So that's another class on angelology. But we can see they're busy. They're fighting and they're doing things for the Lord. Okay? So now we're back in Zechariah. Verse 6 of chapter 6. With one of which the black horses are going forth where? Now we see the direction. They come, their origin is between these two mountains, originally from God, but then I think out through Jerusalem. They're going forth to where? The north country. Now, if you're familiar with the geography of Israel, did anyone ever attack from the east? It was rare. There's a desert on the east. Did anybody attack from the west? Pretty rare. Only the sea peoples, because there was the Mediterranean. They attacked from the north. Air, Assyrians, everybody. They have to come in through the north. All right? So they're going to the north country, and the white horses follow after them, while the dappled ones go to the south. What south? Egypt. You got the big enemies of all time. God's chariots are going after them. Okay? And, and when the strong ones went out, I think this is the red or... I'm really not sure. The grammar is maybe strong ones refers to all of the colored horses. At any rate, it doesn't really matter. They were eagle to patrol the earth. Do you remember the first chapter? We didn't have chariots, but we had angels on horses who were patrolling the earth. Now the patrol is a little different. It's not just looking. It's going to be warfare itself. Okay? Look at this three times. And he said, go patrol the earth. And they patrolled the earth. So you got God's ministering warrior chariots out in the earth with a focus on two of them going to the north, one going to the south. But in the end, they're all going everywhere around the earth. Then I cried out, yeah, I would too if I saw that. <laughs> if you're Zechariah, these prophets, you got to give them you got to give them credit, man. They saw some wild stuff, didn't they? And he cried out to me and spoke to me saying, those who are going to the land of the north, there's a, do you see the concentration on north? Looky here. They have appeased my wrath. You see the difference? It's not just patrolling anymore. It's not just reconnaissance. Now it's full-blown war. God's chariots are going to the north to appease his wrath. Settle the issue. Punish the enemy. All right? In the land of the north. So you got north in there, what, three, four times. Are you with me? It's God's word. <laughs> I can't make this up. This is, but Steven Spielberg has nothing on the scriptures. All right? Better than any movie. So here's what it would look like. You know, these uh, black horses, they head off to the north. And we're going to find out the north country is specifically Babylon. That's going to be obvious. Babylon's already been a prominent enemy, right? Even Mrs. Wicked's going to Babylon to get destroyed. By who? the black horses, and then the white horses, or the chariots being pulled by those horses. And then we see the dappled ones go down to Egypt. And then the red, the strong, they go all over the earth. But really, they all go all over the earth. Okay? So, they're all patrolling the whole earth. Got it? I need somebody to help me with graphics, all right? But I think it makes the point. 
It's similar to chapter 1 where angel singular on each horse was doing reconnaissance. But here it's a full-blown chariot doing war, appeasing wrath. Okay? So we get a little glimpse into spiritual warfare. Don't take that too far, okay? These people go, I'm going to fight Satan. I'm going to beat that demon. They're, they're like laughing at you. You ain't going to beat no demon. All we do is resist with the word of God. Okay? So, these chariots of God go out from these two mountains and they do his business. Now, think about this. They're going to the Babylon to appease his wrath. Again, for the third or fourth time, we go from Zechariah and we move all the way to the book of Revelation. Remember, when Zechariah writes this, Babylon had already fallen. He's living under Persian rule. So it must be out in the future. Listen to this. Revelation 18. And he cried out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become the dwelling place of Evans, a prisoner of every unclean spirit. Hey, you remember Mrs. Wicked? She's hauled to Babylon. <laughs> and boom, God deals with her. Even in Revelation 14, another angel sounds, a second one followed, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon. By the way, these are quotes from Isaiah about the final destruction of Babylon. Babylon fell, but Babylon mystery, the sinful world system, will be crushed in the future. She who made all the nations drink of her, the wine of her passion of immorality. All right? Don't, you, you know, you can't go, I think New York is Babylon. You know, don't do that. <laughs> it seems like it's a real place in the future that might be like the capital of the Antichrist, which is Mystery Babylon, the mother of all harlots. It's going to go down when Jesus returns, obviously. Remember, when Jesus returns, it's not just him. We come with him, plus his chariots are doing business. By the way, brothers and sisters, this is part of the blessed hope. We win. Now, my description of what Zechariah saw is going to be pretty, pretty feeble compared to what we will experience when it does happen. What do you say? I mean, to return with Christ and his chariots and angels, wow. There's an application. We're going to be there when this happens. Okay. Listen to this. In that day, remember I tell you, that's a technical term. In that day means out into the future. The nations will resort to the root of Jesse. Remember that in Isaiah? Who will... The Messiah, the root of Jesse, will stand as a signal for all the people and his resting place will be glorious. It will happen in that day. The Lord again will recover a second time the remnant of his people. You think the Egyptian exodus was big. You wait till Jesus brings Israel back and saves her in the future. Then all the nations are certainly going to, I mean, CNN is going to go, wow, he must be the Lord. Not just any old remnant, but look at this. The remnant of his people who remain from where? Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, that's Babylon. And from the islands of the sea. You think the deliverance was, from Egypt was big. Wait until you see the deliverance God has for Israel in the future. This is a display of his glory when he keeps these promises, which includes forgiveness of sin, restoration of the land, a restored priesthood, King Jesus on the throne. Yum, yum, huh? He'll gather them from all over the earth. So, 
that finishes the eighth vision. <sighs> Any questions? Okay. I'm assuming no one gets it or everybody gets it. <laughs> Now remember, we had a you know ten hour class for three or four days in a row. We could dig into all the cross reference. I'm telling you, there's just oodles of cross references throughout the prophets that are saying the same thing about the day of the Lord when Jesus went. Okay, that finishes the visions. Now there's another passage. Stop visions. A new uh, context, a new circumstance, all right? This is the Messianic crown, verses 9 through 14. Now watch this. I mean, this you get your goosebumps, are going to have goosebumps when you read this. The word of the Lord came to me saying, take an offering from the exiles. Who are they? Remember, those people who came back from Babylon with Zerubbabel to begin to rebuild the temple, some of the exiles have come back, and they've made some money in Babylon. You know, they built businesses, sold them off, made some money, and they bring back offerings and take them from Hell died, Tobijah and Jediah, and go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. This is not the Zephaniah who writes during this time. This is a Zephaniah back in 2 Kings, who was a priest, by the way. I mean, one of the exiles. They're listed in Ezra, too, those group that come back. Where they have arrived from Babylon. See that at the end? Okay. Now, verse 11, take silver and gold and make an ornate crown. Set it on the head of Joshua. Now, we finished the visions, okay? Those are behind us. This is a new scene. So you can picture construction at the Temple Mount going on, and these three guys from the exiles bring gold and silver, and they take it to uh, Josiah's house, and they make a crown. And then in front of everybody, Zechariah says, Hey, people of Jerusalem, stop your hammers and drills. Watch this. And he takes this ornate crown, and he puts it on the head of the high priest, Joshua. Good or bad? Yes. Is a priest allowed to be a king? Oh, no. Forbidden in the Old Testament. Could a king be a priest? No, no, no. Never, never, never. Remember King Saul tried to be a priest? What happened? He lost his kingdom. So what's happening here? The high priest is being crowned. A no-no. Unless it's a symbol. Aha, I'm glad you noticed that. Watch. Set it on the head of Joshua, the high priest. Then say to him, okay, people, watch. I mean, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Behold. Okay, watch this. You, can you see it happening? We, we, need, we need drama. We just need drama. Okay. We need to act this out. So here's the crowd going on in front of the people Joshua, the high priest's head, and Zechariah looks at him and says, Behold, a man whose name is Branch. We've already seen that. The branch, remember, we saw it two different weeks in a row. The branch is a name for the Messiah. Behold, a man whose name is Branch. For he will branch out, remember, a shoot of Jesse, a branch, right? And he will branch out from where he is. Oh. 
Do you get it? I told you, Zechariah has more messianic prophecies than any other book except Isaiah. Even more than Daniel. Folks, you can't make this up. It's so beautiful. Here's Christ in Zechariah pictured as the priest and the king. Right? He's also a prophet, we know that. The one, the prophet greater than Moses, but that's not in this text. Here he's using Joshua the high priest as an example of the office of the Messiah. So, remember Isaiah 11.1? 1, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Who was Jesse? David's father. And from his roots he will bear fruit. Who? A branch. You can't, this is, this is unmistakable. You talk about messianic prophecies, check this one out. Isaiah 4, in that day a branch of the Lord, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. When the branch comes, he's going to save Israel. It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Do you see? That's when their sins are forgiven. You putting it together? Your sins are going to be forgiven in one day. Boom, there it is. When the branch comes, another name for the Messiah. This is incredible stuff. Isaiah 4 or 5, the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke and brightness of flaming fire at night. For over all the glory will be a canopy. When Jesus comes and rules in Jerusalem, it's going to be glorious. Literally. Wow. Jeremiah. I can't read that far away. Jeremiah, verse 20, or chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming. See the technical term? The day is coming. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up a root of David, a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will deal will dwell securely. And in this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. There's no mistaking. The branch is Christ. He's coming. Boom. We need sound effects, don't we? <laughs> okay. It's all over the place. Jeremiah 33, a righteous branch of David will spring forth. You see those words? Wow. Isaiah 53. Every, you know Isaiah 53. Think about this. Who's believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, the Messiah, grew up before him, God, like a tender shoot. God notices. And like a shoot out of parched ground. You know, the Messiah, when he came into Israel, he just popped up like a shoot in the desert. No one saw him. No one noticed. But God did. That was his son. Beautiful. Beautiful about our Lord. So here is the scene. Zechariah takes this ornate crown from the exiles. This is going to mean something in just a minute. Why the gold and silver from the exiles? We're going to get to that. Puts the crown on Joshua. It's a beautiful, extravagant, picture of the two offices of the Messiah as king and priest. Okay? Now, it even gets gooder. And, not only that, he, the branch, will build the temple of the Lord. Okay, what are they working on? The temple. And through the Spirit going through Joshua and through Zerubbabel, they will complete the temple. But there's something bigger. 
this branch is going to be the one who builds the temple of the Lord. Build this temple because the branch is going to build it. We say that every week, don't we? But that's what it means. Yes, in case you didn't believe it, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. So they're working on this one, but yet the Messiah is going to build a temple in the future. All right. We know that the temple of Zerubbabel was destroyed by Herod. Herod beautified it, and then the Roman Herod beautified it during the time of Jesus, and then the Romans came and destroyed it. So this can't be the temple. That wasn't the temple Jesus is going to build. It has to be one out in the future. So when the Messiah comes, his war chariots go out, he sets up his kingdom and builds his new temple. Yum, yum. All right. Not this little one they're working on. It's something bigger. Again, when you're reading the prophets and you come across the phrase, in that day, in those days, or then, you need to go, whoa, whoa. I think this might be talking, or is it talking about something greater in the future? And many times it is. This one's obvious. All right? So Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, if you want some good bedtime reading, you'll go to sleep fast. Read Ezekiel 40 through 48. It's nothing but a contractor's survey of the dimensions of the temple in the future that the Messiah will build. Even the size of the kitchen and the altar. Did you know that? Everything. The storage houses. It's all the measurements are given in those chapters. Now, again, it gets gooder on top of gooder. Gooder rest. And not only will he build a temple, check this out. He who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. The branch, the Messiah, Jesus is going to come and build a temple. And not maybe. He will sit on that throne. Holy smokes. Do you believe it? It's, there's no other way to take this than but to face value this is going to happen. Now, just to make sure we got our interpretation right, Zechariah helps us. Watch the last sentence. He will be a priest on his throne. Ding. Who's the great high priest? Book of Hebrews. Jesus. He's going to sit on his throne and will have, and the nations will have direct access to him. Incredible. And it gets gooder estider. Look at the last race. And the Council of Peace, what is the name for Jesus? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. You can't mistake this. We'll be between the two offices. No king ever could be priest and king, or king and priest. It was forbidden in the law. So... Jesus, he's the only one that can do it because he's perfect. This was a, this was a, these two offices could only be combined in the God-man, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. All right? So there it is. Zerubbabel and Joshua the crown on the high priest, it's all a picture of the Messiah. All right? In verse 14, we have two more verses. And the crown would become a reminder in the temple of the Lord to these guys. Their names change because, you know, in the Old Testament, you have a couple names. 
All right? So think about this. In verse 10, you had them listed, and then they have uh, name changes, which happens in Hebrew in verse 14. Think about this. So here's this crown. As soon as this ceremony is over, and Zechariah explains it to the people, hey, the Messiah, the branch is coming. He'll be king and priest, and he's going to rule in this temple, so keep working on it because he's going to build it anyway. Then, when the ceremony is over, they take the crown and they put it in the temple. As a reminder. So think about the priest all the way to the time of Jesus. Every time they go into the temple, what do they see? The crown. Oh, I wonder what that's there for. Oh, yeah. You know, great-great-grandpa Zechariah said something about a branch, but I don't know what he meant. Let's keep sinning. They totally missed the reminder. The temple's a reminder of the Messiah itself. And this crown was a reminder in the temple. How soon we forget our monuments, huh? Ask kids today what some of the monuments are around Washington. They have no clue. Liz and I were in Prague. We went to John Huss's memorial where he was burned at the stake for the Bibles and no one we talked to in the city knew what it was. Matter of fact, people were taking drugs and acting bad on the very monument of John Huss. So here's a reminder of the Messiah from their prophet Zechariah. I wonder, I have to wonder, if even during the time of Jesus, that crown was still in the temple. And they missed it. Man, that's scary. We can't miss it. (laughs) Don't miss Jesus. All right? The last verse. Okay, first of all, we've got these people working on the temple, right, in Zechariah's day. Then you have verses that say the Messiah will build the temple, right, the branch, correct? Then we have a verse that says this, those who are far off will come and build the temple. (laughs) Because believers and Jews are going to return to the land and work on it under the Messiah's Direction, or I, you know, the general contractor he is, right? <laughs> the perfect general contractor. Oh, I don't have time to read all these, but look, look at this. Isaiah 60, nations will come to your light. Just think when Jesus is on earth, the nations will come to his light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Oh, man, every morning when Jesus, the world gets up and Jesus is on his throne in Jerusalem, Wow. Now we will finish with these, this one, two more slides. Now speak to Zerubbabel. This isn't Haggai, right? Look at this, verse 3. Who is left among you saw the temple in its former glory? All right, verse 4. But take courage, Zerubbabel, and Joshua the high priest. Take courage, okay? They got to work hard because, verse 5. Here is the promise I made when you came out of Egypt. So all this goes back to earlier promises. Look at verse 7 or verse 6. Once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the nations and the earth and the sea and the dry land. God's going to take the earth and the nations, turn them upside down, shake them, and all the money's going to come out for his use. Now watch this. I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of the nations, you see it? Those who are far off will come with their wealth to Jerusalem and contribute to the new temple. Now do you get the vision? Now do you get the what happened? Remember the exiles were from far off and they brought their wealth. Okay? The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. When Jesus comes, you talk about a glorious temple. 
Big time. Big time. And in this place, I will give peace. That's what we just read. He will give counsel and peace. Verse 14. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. When all this happens, you know what? God did send Zechariah. He was right. <laughs> okay? Now only obey, and you'll see it happen. But of course, they, that generation didn't. So, those who far off will come and build the temple of the Lord. Incredible. In Isaiah 2, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be raised up, and the nations will stream to it. People will come say, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways. Wow. I wonder what this Bible verse means. Hey, let's go to Jerusalem and ask Jesus. All right? Sadly, the Jews are trying to build a temple now. You know that? We've been talking about that. It will be used by the Antichrist. It's going to be somewhere up there, either here or there or down here somewhere. You know, I don't know. The sad part is there's going to be another temple before the glorious one, and that's the tribulation temple that the Antichrist will go in, 2 Thessalonians 2, and declare himself to be God. But the Lord will destroy that temple, and he will build this one that we have been reading about. Okay? He'll build the Ezekiel temple. I lied. One last verse. Look at this. Ezekiel 43. This will be, on the context in this new temple, the place of my what? In red. Throne. And the place of what? The soles of my feet. If you had any questions about this being literal, this answers it. This is the, where I, in Jerusalem, in this new temple, the Messiah will put the soles of his feet where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever. Think about a converted Israel with the Messiah in the Holy of Holies ruling the earth. Whoa. I told you, it's better than a movie. Amen? All right, we'll finish there. Any questions? Isn't this rich? You, you see I'm kind of like running crazy. I, I don't know. I, you know we, I think about splitting it up and doing three verses at a time, but I, sometimes it's good when you see the whole package, all this together. But as you go back and read it in the future, you know these things hopefully they'll come back or you pick up the phone and call Mike and Mark and they'll answer the questions. All right. These, these are glorious things. When you think of, the, think of what's going on in the world today, just remember this. He will reign forever and ever, beginning in Jerusalem, over a people that he saves. And by the way, when we get into Zechariah 12 and 14, we're going to see the actual saving and conversion work of the Messiah that will make this possible. Okay? Okay? Father, thank you for your word. It's, it's incredibly rich. And, and who, who, who can even imagine the glories of when this happens? May we be on your side, not the side of the wicked. In Jesus' name, the soon coming Messiah, we pray. Amen.